Hey everyone, this is Nick from NXC Plants. Today I'm going to be going over everything you need to know to begin pollinating your anthurium. First thing you're going to need to pollinate an anthurium is a mature anthurium. A lot of people refer to an anthurium being mature when it hits caterpillar. That isn't a rule across all species. Not all anthurium flower once they hit caterpillar. Quite a few need many leaves after caterpillar. Um, a common example of that is uh, Warquanum. I find it transitions to caterpillar at quite a small size and then it takes until it's a pretty decent size to actually begin flowering. An example I have here is my Ace of Spades. Uh, this one's been at Caterpillar for quite a few leaves and it still has yet to flower. I expect, based off of my friends who also grow this, that it'll flower between three and seven leaves after Caterpillar. <laughs> for the small, uh, from the shorter side, since it's um, a pretty big established plant, but that's just uh, an example. Like, no, Caterpillar doesn't always mean it. Then there's uh, plants like this Pap RA6 here, which flowered on the leaf that came with caterpillar, which I mean, just as early as is possible. So the flower might be a little small. This is probably an example of one I would not pollinate. I'd most likely wait one to two more flowers um, and for the uh, spadix to be a little bit larger. But, you know, it's fun when they flower so small and readily. Here's a good example. Um, paps in general. I don't think I've ever had a pap that didn't flower with um, at least its first leaf after caterpillar. Now the main issue if you do pollinate a juvenile inflow is your yield could be very bad. Sometimes the seedlings will come out a little bit runtier. I don't find that to be a consistent rule. It's usually just lower yield and another potential problem you might have is it might never go receptive or produce pollen. That's very common for the first few inflows. So don't freak out. Uh, and low yield isn't always indicative of immaturity. It could just be the parents you're trying to cross aren't so genetically compatible, or maybe the pollen wasn't as fresh or stored as dryly as ideal. Um, so there's a lot of other factors that can come into play. It's just if it's on a juvenile inflow, you don't know what your potential issue is. A good example of some plants that will tend to always have low yields are luxuriance hybrids if you're pollinating them. Also, uh, it's not always consistent that hybrids will lose the ability to reproduce, but it is sometimes something that happens. Um, on pure species, some ones that produce generally low yields, if any at all, something like queen again, um, if you're lucky enough to get some hybrids out of it, uh, the yield is probably going to be pretty low. With queen, it has a little bit more complicated chromosome issues. That's why you don't see that many queen hybrids. It really depends on the specific queen specimen having a good number of B chromosomes in order for it to be compatible with most of cardio. Um, otherwise, if you have plants within a section, there's a very good chance they're able to breed together. That isn't consistent and it might not work the first time, the third time, or the tenth time, but usually if they're in the same section, you can make it work. And when I say section, just Google the anthurium name and the word section, and you should be able to find some resources that will tell you what the anthurium section is. Whenever I say cardio, it's short for cardiolonchium, um, and that's the one that the majority of the heart-shaped velvet leaf anthurium are in. Um, not necessarily only velvets, uh, just pap, dress, carla, bevep, those ones are all cardio. Another common one you see around is called pachynerium. That's bird nest. It isn't exclusively bird nest anthurium, but it's referred to as the bird nest section, and that's where you see a lot of the um, you know, the garden center bird nest anthurium. You also have SP Nova Panama and a few others in there. So now when you have your um, mature anthurium, your first flower you're not going to be able to do anything with, unfortunately. The plants produce pollen after they go receptive. Some do it at the same time. Um, when you're breeding with those ones, be careful because the plants are able to self themselves when that does happen. So that's just something to keep in mind. If you ever see a plant receptive in pollen and you're planning on selling, make sure you are clear that it could potentially be a self. And I would ideally say you grow it out and make sure that they aren't selfs, but uh, that's not always what people like to do, so just be transparent. Another thing, certain species are known to self. Um, a good example of this is Clarinervium. Clarinervium and its hybrids often self when you think you've pollinated them with something else. So there's a few other species like that, and then there's some species that almost exclusively self, like Bakeria, and let's say it's like, I don't know, Bakeria X crystallinum. It's probably just baker eye. If you, uh, what's an example of this? I have a Delta Force hybrid, and I'm pretty sure it's just a Delta Force self. So that's a good example of a Clarinervium hybrid that is prone to selfing. Once you have a mature anthurium, we're gonna look here. There's gonna be, this right here is the caterpillar, and this right here is the flower emerging from the petiole. Now this part of the flower, it's called a peduncle. And then here we have the spathe, this little leaf thing I'm holding. And then here we have the spadix, and since this is holding berries, this is called an infructescence. When it doesn't hold berries, and it's just a, like a fresh inflow, it's an inflorescence. And then infructescence, once it has the fruits. And this is a compound flower. 
each spot where they make the berry is its own flower. And yeah, so it's just, you know, hundreds of flowers grouped together on the spadex. Once you've got your first anthurium mature enough to produce pollen, we're gonna go, go over how to collect and store that pollen so you can use it to pollinate your first receptive inflow. This plant right in front of me is a Wonder Boy. I have this inflow bagged right now because it's producing pollen and I have other plants in the tent that are receptive. So I don't want any chance, or not any chance, unfortunately there's always a chance um, of contamination because something like a mite or a little fly can come and collect pollen off one inflow and fly to a receptive one. So this is just a way of reducing the chance of pollen contamination. So I'm gonna just take that off without knocking all the pollen off the inflow. And this is just a good way if you have receptive inflows or inflows of pollen to keep them separated. The way I like to collect the pollen is using a piece of tin foil and these uh, disposable watercolor brushes I get off of Amazon. Uh, it sucks using something once and throwing it away. What you can do is label and save it and then use the same brush to apply the pollen to the inflow you're gonna use. I like to do that if the yield is bad or if I'm going to be using that pollen very soon. That way I don't have a bunch of brushes sitting in my fridge, but if I'm gonna use one in the near future, it's nice to have that little bit of extra pollen that's stored on the bristles. And what I do, I put the inflow over the piece of tinfoil and then I just gently brush the pollen off. Now on a plant like this that produces a good amount of pollen, I'm probably going to collect it one to two more times as the entire inflow produces pollen. Right now it's only producing up about 60% of the length of it. The reason I like to do multiple collections on a heavy producer is that way I have multiple vials so I can spread it over more plants. Once you've got your pollen on your tinfoil, a lot of people also use black construction paper so you can see the pollen very well. I transfer it to uh, this thing called an Eppendorf tube. I like to just fold the tin foil without losing your pollen. I'm gonna, I don't, I, I don't know how well you guys are gonna see this, I don't wanna lose the pollen. I just line it up with the tube, take the same brush, and just brush it into the tube. That's all there is to it. Now that I've got my tube, I just take a Sharpie and write what it is and the date I collected it. And with that, I'm gonna take it and put it in the freezer I have a Ziploc bag full of all my little vials. And that's all there is to the collection. Now for the pollen to stay viable, it's important it stays dry and cold. And if you're ever gonna ship it, it's best to ship it with an ice pack. Sorry, I was saving this berry to pluck off the Wonder Boy so I could show the whole process. I just bumped it off the plant. So I'll come back to this. I forgot to say one thing, before you pollinate your anthurium, make sure you have leaves to spare and your plant is healthy because the plants, depending on them and your care and how healthy it is, the plant can decline while it's producing berries. One I find especially sensitive to the berrying process is my BVAP. Um, it's down to two leaves now after harvesting three inflows off of it. So this is a plant that I'd probably give one to two leaves break before beginning to pollinate it again. That's just because I don't want to risk killing it. But yeah, make sure you start with a healthy plant because I, I like to think of leaves as the sacrifice to making berries on some of these. So if you don't have leaves to spare, you can really stress out the plant. Now, you'll know when your plant is ready to be pollinated when it begins producing something called stigmatic fluid. So each of the little flowers on the inflorescence, on this one, it come, they come to a point, but at the end of the point, there's a little bubble of fluid. That tells you the plant is ready to be pollinated. Not all anthurium produce the little bumps from which the stigmatic fluid emerges. Some of them, it's more internal. Uh, one of my best CAF is like that, and it makes it very, very, very difficult to see if it's receptive. So what I would recommend you do is hold the inflow up to a very bright light source and look along the edge for anything shiny. Um, and that's how I often spot when something like that is receptive. So since this plant here is receptive, uh, I'd say pretty much 90% of the length up, I'm gonna go ahead and pollinate it. Now, if you're being really greedy and you wanna pollinate as much of the inflow as possible, you're playing a little bit of a game of chicken depending on the species. Some of them will only go fully receptive for such a short period that you're better off just pollinating when it's maybe this far up or even a little bit less if you're more, if you really wanna pull off the hybrid is what I'm trying to say. Don't waste a receptive moment. Some of them will be receptive over the course of many, many days, but not all of them are like that and they won't always go all the way receptive to the tip, so you might just miss it. Okay, I'm gonna take some BVEP pollen, um, and I'm gonna apply it here to this roto, and I'm just gonna gently brush it along the length of the entire inflow. And since I'm now adding moisture into this Eppendorf tube, it is wasted. You can't get moisture into here. That ruins the pollen. Um, it's fine since you're you know, applying it, but you couldn't apply with some of the pollen in a vial and then come back to it 
a few days or a few weeks later and expect the pollen to still be good to use. So that's another advantage to splitting them up because it really takes very little pollen to successfully pollinate an anthurium. I've done it with like truly tiny, tiny amounts and had very good yields. I'm just trying to make sure I coat every little flower. That's all there is to pollinating. Whenever you pollinate, make sure you label your inflows. I like to use a little bit of painter's tape and then I write what the father is since the mother plant is not going anywhere. So since I used a bee up, I'm gonna put bee up. And then I like to write the date I pollinated so I can track how long it takes for them to, uh, how long it takes till harvest. So once you've pollinated your anthurium, the info is gonna go through several changes. The first one you'll notice is where this guy's at right now. I don't know how well it's gonna come into focus, but the little flower sites, especially if it has nubbins, will begin to swell. Uh, depending on the one, the color will turn green. Not always. The Wonder Boys turn muddy brown. So it's not consistent. Yeah, the colors usually, you can tell. If you're seeing red or orange or yellow spider veining through it, that's probably not a good sign. But once you get past that point, you're still not out of the woods. You'll get to a point where the little sites will start to swell. After this phase, this inflow right here was pollinated a couple months ago. And if you compare it to this fresh one here, can see how much thicker the spadix has gotten. Another good sign, the, this um, spathe has turned green and curled back, but it's still healthy. And so the first phase after it gets a little bit, uh, the little nub swell, is the entire thing will begin to increase in size. After that, you'll get to the point where you'll start to see where each flower was successfully pollinated because they will begin to grow much more rapidly than the areas around them if there was any places where it didn't pollinate. This is a good example because my yield looks to be maybe about a third. So, so you can see on this inflow here, the little flower sites and how they're beginning to differentiate. After that point, now this is a bad example because it's a very low yield, but it's what I have to work with at this time. They will turn green and white and then they will turn red. And once they turn red is when they're ready to harvest. By ready to harvest, I mean you're getting close, um, usually within about a month. I get a lot of questions about like how you know when they're ready to be plucked. Uh, you will know because they'll be hanging so far off. Um, I'll do my best to find a picture and insert it. If you're impatient and they're looking really ripe, you can see a white base around the red cap on the berry for a lot of them. That's how it presents. Just take your finger and ever so gently wiggle it. And if it's not coming free very, with very, very like gentle wiggling, don't try and move it because you, you'll be able to pop them out. But just gentle wiggling if it doesn't like fall out it's not ready. You can definitely harvest them a little early, just not the best. Uh, you generally just want to let them cook. Not all inflows though will do the full cycle. I've noticed this on my Lux hybrids. The inflow starts to die back before the berries have actually um, fully ripened and emerged. I was still able to go in and collect those berries and those seeds did germinate. The yield was just, uh, the germination rate was just not as good as it could be. So just pretend this berry was still attached. And I was like, whoop, and it just was attached by like a little thread and it just pops right off. So once you've got your loose berry, I can't um, do this. There you go, you see this right here? What I like to do, gently squeeze it, and I don't know if you can see it hanging from my finger, it dropped into the water. And that's it, just a gentle squeeze. It's like a ripe berry, like the kind you eat. And the seed just pretty effortlessly pops right out. You can crush the seeds if you use too much force. Very rarely happens. I think I've only done it a couple times and I was just rubbing them between a paper towel very aggressively. But yeah, just gently squeeze it out. Empty berries are a thing, especially on something like the Roto. Usually once you get to that point, you'll get some seeds. However, with seeds, you're not always guaranteed germination, especially on distantly related or more distantly related species. You can often end up with sterile seeds that just don't ever germ. I like to soak the seeds in water after I harvest them because there's a thin membrane called the endocarp around the seed and soaking it in water is a really easy way to loosen it off the seeds. Um, sometimes when you pop the berry, it'll come with it, but I like to soak them in water and then I can just give it a little feel. And if there's anything there, it'll slide right off. Once you do that, it's just about germinating your seeds. So there's all different ways to do it. It really depends on the substrate you like and how you wanna care for them. I do a mix. Sometimes I germinate them straight onto pawn in little seedling cups in a tent. Other times I first start them in like a takeout box with some tree fern at the bottom. It really just depends the plant, how many I have, what my space is looking like. Yeah, just main thing is using a sterile, as best as you can, any sort of mold or microbe free substrate. So yeah, a lot of people like pure fluval, 
people do perlite, people do pond, people do tree fern, people do moss, blended moss. There's all different things you can do. This really just depends what you like to do. Here's an example of one of those little takeout containers with one of my hybrids in it. Here we have a little box of Fort Sherman crossed with Napa and just keep it closed and they go. That's all there is. From pollination to yield, I forgot to talk about that. Uh, it really depends on the species. It can be anywhere from two months to a year or, or even more than a year. Most of the common ones you're breeding with will be generally two to six months. Uh, some faster ones are Carla, some slower ones are Luxurians. That's about it. Uh, if you want to know more, you really just got to look it up by the species. And it seems, in my experience, to be generally consistent within species within a few weeks. I think that about covers it. Thank you guys for watching here to the end. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.